Let's have a quick look at uh, what makes uh, Japan specific today. Uh, the main, uh, the main central banks we study today are the uh, Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, which are the three main central banks. We begin to look a lot at what the uh, uh, Central Bank of China is doing also, but it's quite new, the, the, the China monetary policy. It's really uh, politically oriented. Uh, and uh, it's not a good benchmark today yet. So uh, Japan, compared to uh, the USA and Europe, has quite a specific situation. Uh, it, has got, it's got, it has the lowest uh, unemployment rate in the OECD, roughly for a country with size, and a very low inflation, which is uh, quite uh, um, uh, incoherent with what uh, uh, monetary, uh, traditional monetary policy would say. With, you know, the Philip curves, when inflation is very low, uh, it's because you've got a lot of unemployment and vice versa. Uh, Japan also has a very uh, high chronic fiscal deficit from years to years. You will see the chart later on. And because of this very low inflation and maybe because of this high uh, uh, fiscal deficit, uh, Japan has taken a very uh, aggressive uh, monetary, monetary policy, especially since uh, the, the, the great <coughs> financial crisis. Uh, and so you will see what, what, what makes them today. Uh, the fact is that when I, s I spoke about very stimula stimulative monetary policy, usually when uh, we, sp we speak about that, we speak about uh, mainly interest rate. The interest rate um, for a central bank is the main tool that they use usually uh, in the case of Japan, as is the case for the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve since the, the great financial crisis. Uh, we went uh, into a new uh, area of uh, a new era of uh, monetary policy with a lot of unconventional tools like the quantitative easing and now as you will see with Japan the yield curve control. Okay so let's have a quick look at what Japan looks like today. Alors, first of all all these figures you will see really well, it's just to have a, a an idea of, of what is going on, but the exact figures don't matter really. Uh, what I want to talk with you today is not uh, the fact that the uh, debt to GDP is 150 or 200 or 250% or stuff like that. Uh, what I want to talk to you, uh, with you, is about the mechanism uh, which makes uh, a low interest rate policy or very low interest rate policy or even a negative interest rate policy as we have in Japan or in, in Europe or in Switzerland, uh, what, what this kind of policy entails for uh, the macro equilibrium and uh, the redistribu red sorry about that, redistributive policies uh, as far as fiscal policy is concerned. So uh, now the chart is a little too big for the screen. Well, anyway, you will see roughly, I guess, everybody who followed a little what happened to Japan know about these figures. Uh, the, the debt to GDP is one of the highest in the world. Uh, I think Greece should be in the same league now. Uh, but Japan is a very large country, so that's something which is really uh, unprecedented, uh, which has made uh, a lot of uh, uh, investors and traders uh, for the last 20 years selling that, uh, telling that uh, uh, GGBs, meaning the, the treasuries from the, the Japanese government, uh, so the Japan government bonds uh, were a very bad investment and that uh, you should only sell them. Uh, on the financial markets, uh, we call this trade, uh, which is to sell Japanese government bond, the window maker. Because a lot of people that have tried that since, I would say, beginning of the 90s maybe, and uh, everybody lost his shirt is shirt doing that because uh, when the bonds were yielding three or four percent people were thinking oh they should go back to yield seven or eight percent because uh, Japan has a very big debt to GDP etc etc which is quite the, the I would say the 
orthodox way of thinking. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's how uh, investors today uh, don't want to buy uh, Greek or, or Italian debt because they say their, their, their debt load is way too high and so they should have a big credit risk. In case of Japan, the, the Japanese government bond market proved this false because uh, Japanese yield went only lower and lower for the last uh, 20 years, I would say roughly, uh, on average. And everybody who wanted to take a very uh, <coughs> standard investing approach with Japan and who was selling these bonds, and they could sell them even outright without, without owning them before, just to win in case these bonds uh, went down in price. Uh, everybody who did that went bankrupt because now, as you know, uh, the yield on the Japanese government bonds are around zero, roughly. So, first thing is that even if this uh, curve that you see on the screen looks really alarming from, a, I would say, a fiscal or a credit point of view, uh, it didn't have any effect on the yield that the Japanese government is paying to investors to finance its budget deficit, which is quite large, as you can see. Uh, if I can show you the below, yes, okay, so you'll have the dates there. Uh, so <coughs> you see the impact of the recession, the 2003, the first year, it was uh, the first uh, worldwide recession between 2000 and 2003. And then after the great financial crisis, this deficits around 8-9% of GDP are huge. Uh, we saw some big deficit also in the States. I don't remember what was the figure in 2009, but it was something maybe 10, 10 yeah, I would say 10%. But uh, it went down much faster everywhere, except in Japan, where it stayed very high. Uh, you see that as a, a <laughs> matter of fact, uh, if they were in the European Union, in the Eurozone, uh, they would have problems with Brussels because they are breaching the 3% deficit uh, limit all the time. And uh, they don't care and they should not care, absolutely. They're right about that. Uh, so with this very huge uh, debt to GDP ratio, this very low uh, policy, monetary policy, very easy monetar monetary policy and these big uh, fiscal deficits, you should, uh, you should um, uh, think that inflation uh, would be very high. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's absolutely not the case. Uh, I just made a small uh, adaptation to my chart with the little round there. Uh, because the, the spike that you see in 2014 uh, was uh, only due to the uh, V80 uh, uh, tax hike, which uh, made a small bump, but was not relevant as far as monetary policy is concerned. So you see no inflation in Japan at all. We're still at 0.1 and uh, I don't think it's going to go much higher even now. Uh, so regarding the unconventional monetary policy, the quantitative easing, uh, Japan did that uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, then stopped, then began again, and so they went to new uh, after the, the, the GFC. Uh, you just, this chart is just so you have an idea of the, the amount of money that they put in this unconventional quantitative easing program compared to what the Federal Reserve did and what the European Central Bank did. Uh, you can even see uh, why, uh, <coughs> anecdotically, why the ECB had to uh <coughs> to start its quantitative easing program in 2015 because otherwise the trend was so bad with the balance sheet contracting again that uh, the, the, the European economy was going to uh, crash in deflation again. So anyway, the budge with 83% now uh, of the outstanding uh, GGBs in the market uh, nearly, I would say, eviscerated it's English, it was rated, the GGB market. It's the only big players now. <coughs> Alors, here we go. Alors, let's talk about the yield curve control because that's really the point uh, which matters to us today. 
Uh, I put you a, s a small history there. Uh, I even use I even used uh, some of the data which was in the book that you sent me uh, from the the guy from the J Japan Central Bank, just to be sure that my dates and and numbers were correct. So, um, I know I let you read. I'm I'm not a fan of reading for you. I think you can do that for yourself. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, they, did the, they did ZIRP very quickly, uh, they did quantitative easing very quickly. Uh, since the beginning, the quantitative easing uh, was concentrated on the amount of money that the central bank was injecting, and I don't like the word injecting in this case, but that's how it's used, uh, into the economy. Uh, by buying bonds in the market. That's what the Fed did, that's what the ECB did. In the case of Japan, they also bought some uh, uh, ETF uh, with equities inside from GREITs for, for the real estate. And uh, what did they buy else? I don't remember anything. And but they bought a lot of bonds. And they were uh, thinking that the more money they were, uh, the more money, the more reserves, excess, excess reserve they were putting in the system, uh, the better the economy would be able to perform afterward because it was lack lacking liquidity and it, was, it would push interest rate way down, which was uh, the ultimate goal. <coughs> So when you see the little tricks, they mean like becoming open and dead, open and dead, which means that we will do that as long as necessary. And uh, ne negative interest rate policy in 2016. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you uh, about that uh, on the charts. It's better. And the yield curve when they switch so from monetary base to uh, the yield levels, meaning they wanted to control the yield that the bonds, even the marketable bonds, uh, were uh, going to trade in the market. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a, 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 an implicit contradiction uh, between the quantitative easing program, which was stated to, uh, to inject around roughly 80 trillion, years, 80 trillion yens a year in the, in the market, and the yield curve control. Uh, because if you are a central bank and you say, okay, uh, let, let's use a peg, for example, the, the yield will be uh, 0% or a range, at, as we did at the beginning, minus 10, minus 0 0.10, plus 0 0.10, which went to minus 0 0.2, plus 0 0.2 uh, lately. Uh, if, you, if you say, okay, the, the range is going to be from minus 0 0.10 to plus 0 0.10. That means that as soon as the bonds come up, com comes down in price and up in yield and trades around plus 0.10. As a central bank, you are ready to buy as many bonds as possible to have the yield go down. So in this case, uh, you cannot be uh, limited by a budget of 80 trillion, years, uh, 80 trillion yens a year. If you need 200 trillions or 500 trillions, you've got to take them because you said the yield will stay in this level. So if you want to be credible, you've got to, in, to, to invest as much as necessary, which was uh, the, the principle anyway that they use because uh, the few times that they intervened in the market to say stop, the yield went up too much. They did that when it was at plus uh, 0.11 at what time. Uh, the uh, methodology that they used was the uh, uh, fixed rate uh, auction without any limit in size. On the other hand, if the yield went down too far and the bonds went up in price too much, like if they went down to minus 0.10 in yield, uh, the bonds would, in this case, it didn't happen yet, huh? would in this case uh, threaten to uh, endanger uh, this range and so to, uh, to, uh, to weaken the credibility of the central bank. It then should sell bonds, so doing a reserve quantitative easing, a quantitative tightening, to have the price of the bonds go down and the yield go back up in the range that they say they would uh, impose on the market all the time. If they sell bonds, 
they're obviously not going to use at all the 80 trillion yen a year uh, of budget that they have. So there is a, a fundamental incoherence between the quantity and the price. If you need a price, and if, if you want to fix a price, you don't have to have a limit on the quantity. If you have a limit on the quantity, you don't have an ultimate control on the price. They decided, and I think it was a good uh, idea from them, uh, to, to move their goal from the quantity to the price. But in all the speeches that they, uh, <coughs> they made since this decision, they went on uh, stressing that they had uh, 80 trillion yen a year of quantitative easing program. Uh, everybody knows that it's false. It's not possible, logically, as I explained. They cannot have uh, a fixed uh, amount of bonds to buy and an objective in price. The only reason that they, they um, kept this language in their uh, statement, even though uh, anybody who thinks about it knows it's incoherent, is that they didn't want to scare the market because uh, at these times, uh, a few investors and central bankers or like academics, uh, more on the hawkish side, I would say, uh, were uh, asking for the bulge to taper his, uh, his uh, quantitative easing program, meaning to buy less bonds, because they were thinking that uh, the, the Central Bank of Japan owned uh, already so many bonds, so much a uh, big part, as you see, 84% of the marketable market, uh, that they couldn't buy many more, and so uh, it was not a good idea to say we're going to buy, buy, and buy, and buy. And uh, if the Bosch has had uh, uh, withdraw this uh, quantity from his statement, uh, that would have sent a signal to the market that the Bosch was uh, going to uh, 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 air on the hawkish side, and that was absolutely not the case because they went to a, a price uh, objective which is really more dovish. So that's why they kept this this in the statement, which uh, doesn't mean a lot, but anyway. Alors, let's see the impact on the Japanese bond market of this uh, different policies and you will uh, understand why they moved their decision. Uh, sorry, if I want the dates. Well, anyway. Alors, you can see the first, uh, well, anyway, in 2008-2009, all the yield went down. Uh, it was a big uh, uh, financial crisis. Every uh, central bank in the world was on easing mode. Uh, the Bank of Japan uh, lowered its uh, depot rate from uh, 0.25 or 0.30, I don't remember, to 0.10. And stay put like this uh, until 2015. Only, as we saw uh, on, the, on the schedule before, they upped and upped and upped their quantitative easing program, which helped the, the 10 years and 30 year yields to go down uh, tendentially, but I would say marginally. The big change was in 2000, uh, at the beginning of 2016, when they introduced the negative interest rate uh, on the deposit when it went to plus 10 to plus 0.10 to minus 0.10. Alors, on this, well, I, 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 maybe uh, you'll see that. I, I'll come back to this chart. I'll just explain why. Voilà. The NIRP, so the negative interest rate policy, which, when, which uh, they put in, pla in place, and when you saw the yield go down very, very fast. It's very, very, very powerful. Uh, there is a lot of academical discussion uh, about it. There's a lot of moral discussion about it, of ethical discussion about it. Uh, is it logical that you tax uh, the, the money uh, of the people, of the banks, of the investors anyway? Uh, anybody who has money and doesn't want to uh, invest it, wants to stay in cash, how come uh, you can tax it? It's a monetary decision. Uh, the money is fiat. Uh, we still have some cash uh, in our pockets, and that uh, which cannot be taxed, but it's marginal compared to uh, the, the sum of uh, 
the money which is in the system on the excess reserve. But one thing which is for sure, and I can, uh, I can testify of it because as I'm working on the financial markets myself with many uh, uh, in institutional customers and some uh, bank uh, treasurers, uh, when it happened in Europe, when the, the ECB decided to, uh, to go through the 0% flow and uh, lower its rates in a negative uh, uh, area, at this time we still had in Europe uh, uh, a confidence crisis about uh, peripheral debt, meaning uh, the big banks uh, who have to uh, manage their uh, own reserve and excess reserve and their capital and who invest uh, this money in bonds, they are doing what every bank is doing, which is a, a, a you say carry, carry operation, a transformation, uh, maturity transformation from all the money they have. They invest it in longer term bonds uh, and they make some carry on that and it's the main uh, uh, source of profitability for banks. Then, when they invest this money, they have to uh, decide which kind of credit risk they're going to take. Usually, before the European crisis of 2011-2012 and before the default of the, the Greek government bonds, uh, it was quite straightforward. They could buy any bonds in Europe that they could even go, go and pledge them back to the ECB. Uh, it was considered as a good collateral. Mm -hmm. And so that was quite easy. When the, the Greek government uh, defaulted on its debt, uh, they then realized, as a lot of people lost money on this, on this uh, Greek government bonds, that the, the European debt eventually was not, uh, was not risk-free. Risk Okay, uh, we could speak hours about on this topic because I've been working a lot on that and I still think that it was a huge mistake from Mr. Sarkozy and uh, Mrs. Merkel to decide that Greek should default in 2011 because <coughs> they just broke the European uh, sovereign bond market. Anyway, uh, then uh, when these banks and investors lost money on, on, on Greece, and began to lose money on a mark-to-market -market basis on Italian, Portugal, or uh, over peripheral debt. Uh, they had uh, the, the rule that they should not invest anymore in uh, debt, which was considered now as risky. But what happened when uh, the ECB put its weight in negative territory? The safe bonds in Europe, like uh, Germany, France a little, uh, Austria, etc., uh, went very deep into negative territory. Uh, I, I think the two years G German government, government bond went as low as minus 1% or even maybe even a little lower than that at one time. Uh, so it was a big issue for the banks because they were uh, only uh, presented with uh, uh, money losing uh, investment proposition. And the first month that the deposit, the negative deposit rate from the ECB was put in place, I had a, a good friend of mine, a customer of mine who was working in a tier, tier one uh, European bank. Uh, she was uh, in charge of the, the treasury department, so investing all the money that the bank said, you've got to invest, very secure, there, 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 there. And uh, she, di she didn't want to uh, buy this uh, German government bond sign minus 1% when they could put the money at the ECB on the deposit rate at minus 0.4. It was losing money anyway, but less than buying these bonds, which were uh, really a ridiculous proposition. So, uh, they, as they did any, e every month for the last uh, 50 years, they had put their excess reserve at the ECB. They did that this month, and at the end of the month, instead of receiving money from the central bank, because of the excess reserve who were parked there, they had to pay the central bank. And then came a guy to the desk of my friend who said, uh, hello, uh, I'm in charge of the 
the fournisseur, I would say fournisseur in English, uh, procurement. Suppliers. Suppliers, exactly. Uh, and every time uh, we have to make a, a check or a wire to somebody, I have to have the signature of somebody who is responsible for this uh, thing we bought. And the uh, woman who was in charge of the treasury department had to sign a check of 50 million euros to the central bank. And she says, I'm never going to sign this check. She said, are you responsible? You put your money to the ECB and, uh, and uh, we have to pay them 15 million euros. Uh, I have to have the signature of somebody. And I won't say, I'm never going to sign this. See why? Because I do the job that the bank is asking me to do, is to park the money at the central bank. I never ask to pay 50 million to the central banks. It's not my decision. It's the decision of the central bank to tax money when we deposit money here. And it's decision, the decision of the bank to put the money at the central bank. So in no way, because as you, you know, the very big banks, banks, there are a lot of political uh, uh, career objective in it. And you don't want to sign a check of 50 million. It's <laughs> going to stay on your, on your curriculum vitae all the way. <laughs> Especially when you don't receive uh, any chair or any office or anything <laughs> for the 50 millions, you know. So uh, that went, so the, the guy who had to add a signature was in a very difficult situation. So that went directly to the uh, administra administrative board of the bank with the president, etc. And they had to speak about what are we going to do. So this, the board signed the check anyway, but they realized then they were paying the central bank a lot of money every month. So they made an emergency meeting with all the big heads of the banks. What are we going to do? We don't want to pay this money, etc. And they ask uh, the, the, my friend, uh, what could we do? Say, bah, we could buy some uh, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese uh, one-year bonds, which are yielding uh, one and a half percent, or uh, Spanish bond at 0.8, or, oh, let's do that. And I would say, but you told me uh, six months before uh, never to do that again because <laughs> of the <laughs> Greek default. Yes, yes, uh, we know, but uh, we don't want to do a check to the bank, to the central bank. <laughs> and just like that, because of this aver aversion to spend money or to pay money, which is ridiculous because it's all kind of relative placement, meaning when the deposit rate was at zero and the Portuguese bonds was at 3%, they didn't want to buy the Portuguese, they wanted zero. When they had to pay minus 0.4, they were ready to buy the Portuguese bond at 0.8, which is a stupid trade, but it's really a psychological uh, aspect of trading or investing, which is very important and in, in many, many uh, ways that you are looking at the market. It's, it's another branch, which is a behavioral, behavioral comportmentalism uh, investing. But it's, it, this example was so revealing to me when I spoke with her, and it was very funny, in fact, you know. But the fact that they put this yield in uh, negative territory uh, helped uh, to uh, compress all the spreads in Europe very, very fast, because what this, bing, this bank did, a lot of other banks did the same. And, and then after uh, the bank, the, the funds, uh, so not the banks, the investment funds, huh, uh, began to have the same problem, because at the beginning, uh, when they didn't want to buy anything, they didn't want to buy Portuguese at 2%, too risky, etc. So they just let their money uh, at the bank, at their clearers, bank at zero percent on cash. Ah, two or three months after this negative interest rate, the banks went to the funds and say, hey, I'm not going to take your money at zero percent and put it back at the ECB and pay 0.4 instead of you. So we're going to charge you 0.4 also. And so three or four months later, the investment funds say, oh, what are we going to do with the money? We don't want to pay 0.4. Let's buy some Portuguese debt at 0.8. And so it went on and on like that, and uh, it nearly uh, saved the Eurozone uh, only with that. So it went further after with the European quantitative easing. But anyway, in Japan, you can see <coughs> the move. It's exactly the same kind of behavior. And it's, it's, which is incredible, is when you see the 30-year bonds. 
Because what happened is when they put their, their rates in beginning 2016 in negative territory, the two-year bonds, which was quite positive all the time, uh, even if it was flirting with zero in 2015, went down directly in negative territory too. And knowing that at this time, the decision of the uh, BOG uh, was a surprise because a few weeks before, if I remember well, uh, the president of the BOG uh, was saying that he didn't even consider uh, putting negative rates and then he did that and everybody was wrong-footed. And as uh, we had seen in Europe uh, and in Switzerland and in Denmark, uh, the, the central bank uh, going smallishly negative at the beginning then 0.20, 0 0.30, 0 0.30 always lower because it was never enough. When they put the rate at minus 0.10, everybody was thinking, okay, so they're going to do the same thing. They're going to minus 0.20, minus 0.30. Anyway, who knows? We, we were even uh, guessing in Europe at this time if the ECB was not going to go even lower than minus 0.4 at the time. And so the two-year yield went lower than minus 0.10 which doesn't sound logical because if you have money, uh, you prefer to lose 0 0.10 than 0 0.15 or 0 0.16 uh, buying uh, two years now. But people were uh, pricing the possibility that this uh, deposit rate could go even further in negative territory. So it was better to lock a minus 14 with two year bonds than waiting for the deposit rate to go at minus 20 or minus 30. At this time, so even the 10 year bonds went through the negative went in negative territory. And so you can guess that everything which was between two years and, and 10 years went in negative territory. So that left uh, for the investors or banks who don't want to pay and they don't want negative interest rate, as was the case with the example I gave you about the ECB before. Uh, only one possibility is to buy whatever bond available which has a positive yield whatever the maturity. And so they went down at, at the time to buy some 30-year bonds at 0.20, which was worth a few months before 1.40, which is a huge move for a 30-year bond, which has a very long duration. So in price, I would say uh, it maybe it's something like a bond could go from 100 to 130 points. So that's very, very expensive. But uh, at this time, the people lost uh, all their benchmarks and uh, the only uh, uh, preoccupation they had, the only goal they had, was to lock in positive rates. <coughs> up, 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 up. Ah, every quantitative is about yield curve, yield curve control. Uh, alors. A small word about that, why I wrote that down. Uh, when uh, the Federal Reserve did its first uh, quantitative easing program in 2009, um, the statements uh, of the Federal Reserve at this time were really uh, uh, read very carefully by the people for, for who uh, this kind of stuff matters. And we all have the, the luck with the Federal Reserve that uh, I think it's five years because I read 2009 and 14. I think five years after, their, uh, after the meetings, uh, all the details of the meeting are published. Okay? Uh, so uh, we know now uh, what they were really thinking about in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, yeah, I think it's five years. Uh, when they were deciding to implement quantitative easing in the USA. Uh, at the times, I, I can tell you that the statements were not ringing very truthfully to the ears of people who were uh, watching monetary policy very closely, uh, because as is, was the case in Japan, but sounds logical with uh, Bernanke, a friend of mine. Uh, uh, they insisted a lot on quantities. 
let's say we're going to do a 200 billion program or a 400 billion program of a 600 billion program, etc. We're going to inject reserves in the system, excess reserve. If I remember well, uh, Mr. Bernanke went even on CNBC uh, to the 60 minute emission of CNBC to explain what he was doing because uh, the, the public was a little confused and he used, he used the, uh, the uh, phraseology of the printing press and saying I'm only printing money by pushing on the button. I don't need any uh, real printing press now. It's all electronical, uh, which was completely false. But uh, I think he was seeking a way to explain this stuff to the general public who was not very, uh, very uh, familiar with this kind of operations. But I still think that he should have uh, done a better job of uh, explaining what he was really doing. So, however, when you read now uh, what these guys were talking about during the Federal Reserve meetings and when they decided to do some quantitative easing program, uh, the calibration that they use, saying we are going to do 100 or 200 or 400 billions, we're going to do mostly treasuries or we're going to do MBS also, the mortgage-based security, uh, all the, the calibration was done um, um, considering what the market reaction would be. Meaning the staff of the Federal Reserve, which is in contact through the Federal Reserve of New York, which is in contact with investors all the time, with primary dealers, etc., uh, speaks to them before the meeting and say, if we do that, what do you think? Or what do you think we should do? What do you think we can do? not giving any hints of what the Federal Reserve is going to do, but just to have an idea of what the, reac the reaction will be from the markets. And so they knew that if they did, for example, $200 billion uh, of quantitative easing pro program, they, are, they were going to lower the yield on the Terrian bond by roughly 10 BP. Which means that, in reality, their objective was not a quantity objective. It was a price objective also. They wanted to lower the rates on government bonds because that would help uh, what we call the global uh, financial condition index to get better because if the, the, the yield on government bonds goes lower, the dollar goes lower, the stocks go higher, the, the stocks of banks goes higher, the, the credit, the, the corporate bond goes higher, so everything that's good for the economy that would help the Federal Reserve uh, <coughs> accomplish his, his, his drill mandate, etc. But the fact is that they were aiming at an objective in price. Question is, why didn't they say it was an objective in price and uh, why was it always stated as an objective in quantity? like the, the Japan did before they went through the yield curve control. Uh, we have two reasons for that. The first is that it, it, was, it was a theor theoretical construct uh, coming back to Friedman and Bernanke also uh, was working on that, uh, which states that the excess reserves in the system are going to help banks uh, lend money to the real economy. Okay, we know that. That we know now that this is not true. Banks don't need excess reserve to lend to the real economy. They create their own reserves and their own deposits when they lend. But it's a very uh, a traditional way of thinking. That is, the more liquidity the central bank push in the economy by creating excess reserve the more the banks are going to lend. Anyway, the second reason that they didn't want to speak openly, that they were aiming at prices and not quantity, is linked to the political uh, state of the American markets and American leaders, where they didn't want to admit that they were trying to manipulate the prices, knowing that Americans believe in the very free markets, where supply and demand are going to create the price and not the central bank, which is creating money out of thin air because that would be too easy. So uh, even if their goal was a goal in price, they could not 
uh, speak openly about it. So that's why I said every quantitative easing, and it's the same case for Europe. Huh? Uh, it's not about uh, quantity, it's really about yield curve control. Alors, last one, the Chuck Norris effect. I love this one. The Chuck Norris effect, uh, I didn't invite, uh, invented this uh, sentence. I think it was Lars Christensen uh, and it was, uh, it was used by Cullen Rush, you see, I don't know, from the, the Canadian, you know, the Canadian Wolf, Wolfwild uh, Monetary Economic blog? Well, I'll send you a link. It's quite interesting. <laughs> and uh, so the Chuck Norris effect, um, it's a concept which, which has a few years regarding monetary policy, and Chuck Norris is a little older, older than that, uh, states that if a central bank is credible enough and say the range is going to be minus 10 plus 0.10 for the 10 years Japanese government bond, uh, they won't have to buy or sell any bonds. Because the market knows that if the bonds goes to plus 0.10, the central bank is going to come there and buy as many as possible. So the price is never go through this level. So anybody who is selling bonds when they are trading at 0 0.09, 0 0.09 and a half or 0.10 yield is going to lose money because the only way for the bonds to go after that is lower back in yield and higher in price. Same case when it goes to 0.10. Uh, I, I hope you're quite familiar with the, the price and yield effect on bonds, uh, because it's not always the okay, case, so I just want to be sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, that means that if the market knows that the central bank is going to intervene at 0.10 and stay, there's no way the bond is going to yield higher than that, and, or the price of the bond is going to be lower than that. Nobody is even going to, to sell at this level. They say, I can only sell at better price if I wait. And same thing where we are on the other uh, end of the range. So that means that a credible central bank, which has enough firepower, of course, in reality, won't have to intervene a lot. Because the market is going to intervene for him at the extreme of the range. Because if you go at minus 0.10, and you know the only way to go is up 20 basis points the other way. You want to play this range and not play that you're going to maybe win a fraction of a BP at this, at this uh, place. So uh, we have been seeing that uh, with uh, Japan because uh, they did intervene a few times when, the, the when they had the minus 0 0.10 plus 0 0.10 range when it threatened the point 10, one day it went, if I remember something like point 15 in the day, and the central bank was not ready. They, was do they were doing something else, I guess it was lunch or something. And uh, as soon as they went back to their desk, uh, they say, okay, it's trading what point uh, 15, uh, but I'm buying uh, as much as you want at point 11, which was like, uh, like uh, in price uh, 30 cents higher than the last price traded. So everybody who thought at the time that the central bank uh, was not going to uh, do his job, uh, was uh, severely burned, uh, hurt by this trade. And so uh, after that, uh, the, the market didn't uh, test really uh, what the, the Japan Central Bank was trying to do. Up. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Alors. So now, about the mechanism. Um, <coughs> from the, the, what I've told you uh, since the beginning, I guess you understood that I don't have uh, a lot of problems with uh, a central bank intervening in the market and uh, fixing the prices of the bonds where it thinks they should trade. Uh, not everybody thinks the same way. Uh, as I told you, in the States, uh, they mostly want the market to be a free market and prices to be, uh, to be uh, determined by uh, supply and demand of private investors and that the States uh, must do nothing about it and it's not its job. Uh, one of the, the main uh, academic arguments to uh, to help this position is to say that there is a natural real rate 
on government bonds, which is the weight where uh, the yield, where uh, the economy is neither too old nor too cold, the Goldilocks, uh, as we say, and uh, where inflation is at its objective and unemployment is at its lowest point possible. Uh, this natural real rate uh, is a very uh, uh, attractive concept. Uh, it's it's the way the, that it's with this concept that a lot of rules, like the Taylor rule, uh, were created, which was which was uh, a mathematical rule uh, trying to help the central bank determine. Uh, where it should put his uh, uh, own direct or deposit or discount rate uh, so that uh, regarding this kind of inflation, this kind of growth, etc., uh, etc., et with a few coefficients that they always tweak back to fit the curve uh, with respectively, uh, that would be the good na uh, real rate to, to try to, uh, to aim at. The problem is that this natural real rate uh, is always a backward looking figure. Meaning, and even now, and, and it's, it's a positive thing for, uh, for the central banks, uh, central bankers now uh, begin to, uh, to, uh, to say openly that they don't have a real clue about what the real uh, natural rate should be now. It used to be uh, 3% in the 90s. Uh, the consensus about, uh, I would say, the consensus uh, with central bankers now would be around 1%, but some would say, it would even say it could be negative. So that means that all these mechanical, mechanical rules, mathematical rules uh, like the Taylor rule, uh, Taylor rule sorry, are not very helpful uh, right now. Uh, and anyway, uh, even if I'm not uh, <coughs> doing a lot of microeconomy myself, I'm not uh, looking at the balance sheet of companies and stuff like that. Um, anyway, some micro is, it is useful sometimes. Uh, I can guarantee you that uh, in my company or in any uh, real uh, economy company that I know of uh, with friends who work uh, in the industry, in the service industry or stuff like that, in the manufacturing industry. Uh, there is no way that if the uh, discount rate of a central bank is minus 0.5, plus 0.5 or plus 2 percent, that will have any impact on, of, on their wage negotiation at the end of the year with their employees. The only thing that they are going to look at is the supply and demand for their business and you have, they have money enough to pay more the, the, the employees if the employees ask more, otherwise they won't give them any more money, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, how is the market for their goods and how is the market for their employees, meaning our, our they will have to pay more if they are afraid that their employees are going to go to work for a competitor. But the monetary policy uh, at, at the uh, level of any firm uh, is, is not relevant to the, the wage, wage bargaining that happens every year or during the year. So the price setting formation and the central bank monetary policy um, I, it's a big question mark today. Uh, that's why uh, we see, for example, uh, in the USA, uh, the, f the, the staff from the Federal Reserve uh, lowering its NERU, you know, the non-accelerating inflation uh, uh, rate of unemployment, thank you, uh, that uh, at one time, it was just after the GFC when the, the unemployment went through the roof. Uh, when it began to come back down, they say it should be around 8, then 7, then 6, then 5, and now we are 4, and they don't even know where it is anymore, and some say it should be even lower. So, uh, accounting, accounting effects, sorry for my English. Huh? Um, <coughs> 
So that relates to the problem of quantity that we spoke uh, about before and uh, the problem of excess, excess reserve. Uh, as I told you, uh, when Mr. Benanke told they were using the printing press, uh, a lot of people didn't agree with the, the terms he used because uh, that's not, uh, I would say, uh, that's not the truth, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, when the uh, central bank in a quantitative easing program buys bonds from the private sector, uh, they don't inject money in the real economy. They just swap an asset, which is in the hands of the private sector, which was a bond, against some uh, deposits, excess reserve, cash money, as you want to think. That means that if the pr private sector in the USA before the quantitative easing program was worth $10 trillion of assets, even if the central banks makes a program of $1 trillion of assets buy, at the end of the program, the total assets of the private sector are still going to be $10 trillion. The only difference is that in their portfolio, instead of uh, 4 or $5 trillion bonds, they will have $1 trillion less and $1 trillion cash more. But there is no real injection of worth in the system. There is just a change of composition in the uh, asset allocation of uh, the private sector. So it's really not the same thing as a printing press, as people think about it, like when they think about Weimar, about the way some uh, African uh, countries uh, are paying their uh, uh, employees by printing uh, real bills and real notes. So that's not the same thing. Uh, on the other hand, so just I, I just uh, uh, insist on that because to give you just an anecdote, when the, the Federal Reserve launched its first quantitative program uh, beginning of 2009, if I remember well, uh, I had some uh, customers who were the Tiger Funds, you know, uh, from the, the, the hedge fund uh, in New York. And some very, very smart guys who had, uh, who had managed to go through the panic of 2008 quite well. And when they heard about this uh, quantitative easing program of uh, Mr. Bernanke, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, the pr printing press is going in. So uh, we will have hyperinflation down the road. And I remember, uh, I didn't agree with them at all at this time, so they didn't do the trades with me, by the way, because I was not working directly on this market. But they bought some uh, options uh, on US government bonds who would benefit, so I, I, if I remember well, the 10-year government bond at this time was yielding something, let's say around 2 or 3%, uh, and, and they were uh, buying uh, puts on bonds, meaning coal on the hills, if the government bonds in 10 year times were going to yield more than 10 percent, which we had not seen on 10 year bonds, 10 percent, I would say, since 1986 or something like that, to 1985. So that was really a very uh, uh, unconventional bet from them, but they were really convinced that this quantitative easing was so socialized, so anti-market, so Zimbabwe, so Weimar, that the only way uh, down the road was to have imper inflation in the USA. As you could see, they did one quantitative easing, two quantitative easing, three quantitative easing, and who knows what, and uh, they still uh, didn't uh, reach their target of 2% inflation. So, Quantitative easing per se is not inflationary because of the printing press. There is no printing press. And second stuff, uh, if you want to look at it, and, and it's the same thing for the question after inflationary and this feeling of, lo of low rates, uh, when uh, the central bank changed these assets in the uh, portfolio of private investors, 
Meaning, for example, let's say they only had bonds before, and the central banks decide to do a massive quantitative easing program and buys all the bonds from the private sector and lets the private sector owning holds only <coughs> cash equivalent deposits or reserves. Uh, the years before, the American Treasury was uh, paying, let's say, a, a coupon a yield of three uh, percent a year on its bonds, meaning for 10 trillions, they will say paying uh, 300 billions a year of interest that would go directly from the government coffers to the private sector coffers. Okay, when you buy all the bonds from the market and you leave them only with cash. They are not going, especially in the ZIRP policy when rates are at zero, they are not going to earn money anymore. This 300 billion a year of coupons which was paid by the government is not paid to the private sector anymore, it's paid to the central bank which gives it back directly to the treasury after that because it's a subsidiary of the treasury regarding tax and profits. So that means that if you are thinking through a Keynesian lens and saying that in case of a recession, the government must spend more to help the economy come back on its foot, if you do a quantitative easing program and take money, I would not take money, take revenue out of the private sector, you are shooting yourself in the other foot. Because on, your, on one hand, you, as a government, you want to spend more money to help the private sector go back on its foot. And on the other hand, with the quantitative easing, you take back $300 billion from, uh, of revenue that uh, each year the government was giving to the private sector. The fact is, as a mathematical construct, that's irrefutable, that's true. The fact is that what is important is a distributive effect. But what you know is that this hundred of billion of dollars of coupons which the government was paying to the private sector every year is going to a very specific part of the population, meaning the high net worth uh, individuals and the pensioners, the older people, mostly. And when, thank you, and when uh, you want to do uh, uh, a Keynesian uh, boost to the economy, that's not to this guy that you want to give money to. It's to the lowest earning people, so that can be adapted. Uh, which, alors, so I, I know we've got only a few minutes, so I, I, go, I go there. Uh, once, just one thing, also, the low rates, environment, when you've got very low rates, uh, that helps also companies who have troubles in difficult times to survive. Okay, because uh, they have uh, less uh, uh, trouble to refinance their debt, etc. And the, the yield they pay on their bonds or to their banks is also a cost in their input. If you lower this cost and help them survive, that helps a lot of company uh, to uh, keep on going, being competitive with the other ones. So that's a disinflationary effect. And as you lower one of the input costs, it's also a disinflationary effect. Okay, and uh, let's 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 keep uh, the voting uh, stuff <laughs> for for the question. That's okay. Good on time. Thank you. So it's now our turn. So Casey, Alice, and I will present uh, some background information on what we just heard on the whole topic. So therefore, I will actually give you some. Um, background information you could say on the yield curve and other unconventional monetary policies implemented by the Bank of Japan since the 1990s. Um, we will then go on talk about some successes and challenges of the yield curve control and as the third point how the Bank of Japan could actually proceed. So this would actually be then the part what is next after the yield curve before we then open up the discussion for all of you. Um, so let's start right away. Um, we've seen a already or heard it already that uh, un unemployment in Japan from 1990s to actually now is relatively low, uh, which you can see in that graph. And 
which is quite surprising on the other hand that inflation is re relatively low. Okay, the quality of this graph is horrible. Um, but if you can see the, where the zero line is, we have only three periods uh, since the 1990s um, where inflation was above the 2%. So which was around here, there and there, and twice it was just because of uh, increases in the consumption tax and once in the middle about the consumer prices that increased. So we do have mild inflation since now a few decades, but not um, devastating um, deflation. No, we have mild deflation and no uh, devastating deflation levels, which learned uh, lean, no. Sorry, I was just two weeks in Austria, too, speaking too much German, so <laughs> back to English now. Um, so no deflationary spirals. So the big question is, what is the problem with this mild deflation? This is what I want to go into right now. Just to give you the intuition why um, Japan is fighting this uh, very much with all these unconventional monetary policies again. Um, so we have a few points up here. Um, you can say that mild deflation has an adverse effect on the Japanese economy. So it reflects a long-standing negative output gap, which is defined as potential GDP to um, real GDP, um, nominal GDP as a percentage of p a potential GDP, which suggests a chronic demand shortage since a few um, decades now. So we have sluggish potential economic growth, which leads to a weaker economic outlook and weaker aggregate demand. Um, we also have demo demographic factors in Japan which um, include an aging population, a decline in the total population and also uh, very slow uh, structural reforms. Um, the mild deflation is also associated with, with the yen's long-term appreciation trends vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US dollar and in the end we have a few um, important uh, strategies which are reflecting these uh, deflation um, tendencies. So firms are trying to put their pricing behavior uh, in line with this deflation and also um, pursue only low investment levels. Then there's households which um, show rather high saving rates because of this uncertainty and financial institutions apply risk-averse investment behavior which means that they uh, invest in rather considered safe assets. Um, so we have this graph again which you've just seen and now I want you to focus on this light blue ones um, on top of it, because these are actually higher. Maybe it's a bit better now. Um, because here we have uh, the four main um, unconventional monetary policies which have been adopted in the past few decades. We've heard them very fast before. The, the first one was the zero interest rate policy. Then we have quantitative e easing. The third one is comprehensive monetary easing. And then the fourth one we want to focus on today, it's not even seen here very well, is the quantitative <laughs> and qualitative monetary easing. So that's the fourth uh, one right here, which is the abbreviation is QQE. <coughs> and there's actually three phases of this one. Um, there was the first phase, which is just the QQE and the expansion of it. Then we have the QQE with a negative interest rate. And the third one is actually the yield curve <coughs> control. Um, so the whole idea what Japan is trying, or the Bank of Japan is trying to achieve is a 2% price stability target. So this is all what it is about. And the question is how it's going to achieve this with its monetary policy. So I want to go very fast into the mechanisms here. So we have the long-term interest rate they want to uh, change, actually, which is makes up out of a risk premium and the expected path of future short-term interest rates. So when we have uh, purchases of Japanese government bonds, this should lower the risk premium which should then lower also this expected path of future short-term interest rate and thereby uh, decrease long-term interest rates. Um, on the other hand, then this, um, this more stable outlook and so will then probably also reverse this. Um, so this expected path could also go up again. And so this whole idea of the yield curve control has two transmission uh, the whole of this quantitative qualitative easing actually it has these two main transmission mechanisms. Uh, so please, if this is 
not exactly right, please correct me then. Um, we have this 2% target and monetary easing, and this should actually then lead to a rise in long-term inflation expectations. W and in addition, with lower nominal interest rates through these Japanese government purchases, we would actually want to have lower long-term real interest rates, which should increase investments, thus aggregate demand, and in the end have uh, improve our output gap and inflation. So this is the main mechanism. Um, I've put up here these three phases, the main um, policy targets, and what we have heard quite a bit about all these three. So I want to focus again on the third one, which is the topic of today, and that is the yield curve control. So we have this... Um, <coughs> two targets. We have the negative interest rate on the one hand still and this 10-year yield of 0% they want to approach. Um, we have still, we now still have this yield um, target rather than this monetary base target and what um, we've heard before that there is a very big ambiguity because they're still saying that this yield curve control is only an extension of the previous monetary policies but actually um, that this one actually dropped this quantity uh, dimension because you cannot have actually a, a quantity goal of about 80 trillion yen uh, and still want to have the same um, goal of a 10-year yield of 0%. So this is a bit of a strange uh, move by the Bank of Japan, but maybe they just wanted to see uh, or make clear that it's only a continuation um, of the previous monetary policies instead of admitting that it's com something completely new or that why they had to change their monetary policies. So now Alice will go on with some successes and challenges. Okay, yeah. So uh, now I'm really quickly going to talk about some successes and challenges for the YCC and compared to uh, the qu quantitative easing like before. So first of all, we can say that um, the pace of uh, government bond purchases is becoming more sustainable for uh, the central bank because, um, well, as you can see, the central bo the Bank of Japan owns more than 40% of the asset and the remaining assets in the private sector that they have to buy um, are like the holder uh, are becoming really priceless sensitive because they're not holding the mm -hmm. assets for monetary reason, so it's becoming really hard to buy even more assets and giving up on the quantitative objective of uh, 80 trillion yen uh, purchases every year enables the uh, interest, uh, the long term yield to increase. Uh, here you can see like the price of um, the bond like increased a lot. And so that's first success and then also on the um, exchange market uh, it leads it enable some kind of yen depreciation compared to the dollar um, due to the capping around the percent of the interest rates the long term interest rate because after term selection you have a huge rise in uh, the um, a long term yield of the US uh, due to expectation of growth and inflation. And then you had a spillover effect all over the world. That means like in every country you have the same rise in long term yields, except in Japan <coughs> due to the capping. And then you have then an expansion of the like interest rate differential between the US and Japan. And as you can see, um, well, here you have the um, the appreciation of the dollar, and then you all, you obviously have some kind of appreciation of the um, yen, but now with some kind of depreciation trend, but well, we don't know how sustainable it's going to be because some people say that actually the US or dollar have been uh, overvalued since mid 2014, so we'll see. And then we can also say like that is a smooth transformation toward uh, more normalization since we shift the Bank of Japan shifted from a quantitative based uh, policy to a price based policy. So of course, like as I want to say, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, they're not really giving up on the quantity since uh, the quantity is used to uh, get the uh, interest rate, but well, to have this target is maybe m closer to the standard view of monetary policy. But there is still a lot of uh, issues and challenge. 
And first of all, we don't see anything on the graph, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you can <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will explain you basically. Uh, well, you know, I mean, they don't. They still have a really low inflation. There's but no inflation. Right. There's yeah. no inflation. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is no inflation, yeah. and maybe sometimes even negative. But um, yeah, but as Erin say, I mean, there is on the this graph. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we see, it's maybe due to the fact that actually YCC is not necessarily an infl inflationary policy. And if you, well, I'm just going to use the graph. And why is it maybe due to? It's maybe due to the really mm -hmm. limited impact on demand driven inflation. And, um, well, low inflation rate can be seen by household and firm only as a reflection of the fact there is going to be no growth or no inflation and not as a demand-led stimulating uh, policy. And so, um, well, if the market doesn't understand what the purpose of the policy, it's really hard. And then, as you might know, to have a demand-driven inflation, you must have demand. And uh, as you cannot see uh, also on the graph on the top, uh, there was no increase at all on the real wage for now a decade. And there is a real uh, increase in the ra uh, share of the non-regular workers here, uh, like it increased a lot compared to regular workers. And they're also in, uh, increasing wor uh, concern about the sustainability of the social security system with the aging of the population. So actually what happened, is, uh, what is happening is that the household uh, tend to save more and to spend less and to invest less. And so of course in such an, uh, an environment, it's really hard to raise price and to get any uh, inflation. Then also um, you have, well, uh, Hannah talked a little bit about that, but you have a decreasing term premium and then negative term premium even. And since long term yields, uh, term, long term term premium is usually positive and more important for long term bonds because they are supposed to be riskier and then short term bonds. Uh, in this case, it's really hard for uh, commercial banks to charge uh, the loans they make to the corporate sector in an appropriate way, reflecting the risk of lending. And so that might lead to no credit at all or to non-performing loans. And this is quite maybe dangerous for the corporate sector. And eventually also they might have a lack of coordination with the Minister of Finance because at the same time that they were doing the YCC, so buying less long-term bonds and getting a and um, yield curve. The Minister of Finance increased the share of long-term bonds um, in total issues and reduced short-term bonds. That means that you have actually more demand and uh, less supply on short-term bonds and uh, the <coughs> opposite phenomenon on long-term bonds. And since, like, if short-term yields decrease excessively in negative territory, well, it might be detrimental for commercial to commercial bank since the uh, corporate sector uh, lending concentrate uh, on maturity of three to five years. And that's all for me. And now we're going to think about the perspective. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Bank of Japan perspectives. Uh, it's more or less like what they, how they should manage the, the, the policy after mm -hmm. 2016, 17, 18 and so on. So uh, first, in 2017, uh, Japan was synchronized with the global growth. So they had a good performance. Uh, there was stable long-term yields on US treasuries, so there was no upward pressure on Japan's yields. Uh, there was a stable exchange rate of the Japanese yen vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Uh, so it was a, a good economic <coughs> time to try to normalize this uh, policy. So to move towards the normalization of the monetary policy. Uh, however, uh, the Japanese low inflation is likely to be more structural than cyclical. Because even after these years of the monetary policy, the quantitative easing, yield control, uh, the inflation uh, stays in 0% in 2017, I think, or 2016. Uh, so it, 
it was it's not something about uh, slickity of the economy. It's more uh, structural. So maybe uh, it's not so good to continue with this policy in the next years. Uh, so in the course of 2017, it would be good. Uh, it was good that the BOD reduced the pace of the monetary accommodation, but we are in 2019 now. <laughs> um, however, uh, it is difficult to the BOD to take any step towards the monetary no normalization. Uh, even in 2018, it was already difficult because the dollar proceeded again. Uh, the government and the BOD may be increasingly concerned that a change in the BOD's course of action may trigger a further appreciation of yen. So, with the appreciation of the dollar, maybe it's not so good to do this. Uh, it would be harder for the BOD in 2019 and 2020 also because there is this construction uh, and the Tokyo Olympics uh, games. Uh, other firms' business investment is expected to slow, and the synchronized global growth that happened in 2017 is started to soften now, since 2018. Um, about this monetary policy normalization, uh, there are some steps that uh, come prior to this normalization. Uh, before taking any step, uh, toward monetary policy normalization, the BOD needs to introduce flexibility in the interpretation of the 2% price stability target. Uh, since 2016, when the, the uh, Bank of Japan tries to put this 2% uh, uh, target, uh, the public and the market did not understand what, what <coughs> was deflation, what was the measures, so it was a problem of understanding. Public was had this difficulty to understand. Um, and there are some steps towards monetary policy normalization that includes the phases prior to, norm to this normalization. Uh, that is the phases in which the BOG reduces the annual pace of financial assets uh, towards zero and raises the 10-year yield target. So there are some measures before really uh, normalizing the monetary policy. Uh, so this is the sequence of steps, it's good, you can see. Uh, first, it should be since September, so it, it, this is more uh, the view of the Asian development banks about how they should um, manage this policy, so now we are in another time. But uh, they should cut before the annual pace of JGB purchases. Uh, introduce the 10-year yield target together with the JGB purchases. So at the same time, do this, the, these two uh, actions in the market. Uh, and then removing the 10-year yield, cutting the JGB purchases, and then go to the uh, raising short-term policy rate. So these are the steps uh, prior to the normalization. Uh, so, uh, the BOD need to realize more sustainable JGB purchases. Uh, they should eventually clarify its intention to reduce the annual pace of the monetary base expansion. So, they should uh, tell to the market that they want to normalize or to, to clarify more about this JGB purchases. Um, and these amounts should, could gradually be reduced towards a more sustainable level. Um, okay, so it, the informing the market what they want to do is an important issue. Um, so, uh, raising the 10-year yield target, uh, the BOD could uh, raise the 10-year, uh, the idea here is m make more flexible this uh, policy, so they could make a, a target or put like a range around 0 0.25 or 0 0.5 uh, to not just uh, settle uh, a rate but just have some flexibility into this uh, moving towards to this normalization. Um, 
So uh, when the 10-year yield is eliminated, uh, the adoption of the target uh, with a gradual widening would enable markets to respond to the changes in demand factors. Um, and the last figure that I want to show is about these uh, ETFs that are uh, some really is risky, risky, risky uh, assets. Uh, the BOJ was increasing the the uh, was purchasing this uh, these assets, but if uh, it reduces the this this, um, this action. It could happen that the market may, may be financially unstable and put some downward pressure on these uh, stocks of these this, uh, papers. So uh, the idea of uh, explaining to the market what they want to do and making it more clear and more flexible is the, 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 the main uh, issue for this paper that, I, that we propose to you and the, bank, the Asian Development Bank about what they want, have to do. Uh, we have some conclusion and discussion questions. Uh, this is for? Just questions? Uh, we have some questions here. Uh, first, uh, I saw a graph talking about the, the transmission mechanism between these commercial banks and the, 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 the policy. Uh, the growth of these loans were not so increasing, so there was a problem with this mechanism between the policy, like the central bank pushing uh, to putting more money in the economy, trying to uh, hit the economy, but the commercial banks are not so responding to this. So, uh, what are the actions the Bank of Japan are uh, trying to uh, to take this in this regard? Uh, do you want to? Um, after your presentation, um, this question might be put wrongly, but I read an article about, uh, at the of the Financial Times saying that uh, the ECB should uh, uh, apply the yield curve control as it provides beautiful deleveraging. After, you, after your presentation, it was actually said that every QE actually includes already a yield curve control, so... Maybe <laughs> this article is a bit wrong, so maybe you can <laughs> clarify this again, if this is actually a good strategy to apply per, uh, or not, or implicitly or explicitly. Um, <coughs> another one is, which is related to what Alice uh, talked about, so should the government or the central bank have any uh, reasons to actually uh, step back from the yield curve control in the Bank of Japan for now, or what are the incentives for anyone to actually impose a change in the strategy of the monetary policy. And <laughs> in the end, um, the big question is, I think in the book we've gotten is, what went wrong in Japan? So why does it take so long in Japan to reach this 2% target, although they're trying so hard? So if you could comment on our questions maybe first, and then it's up to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, okay, let's do that. <coughs> I, sorry. I, I'll, keep, I'll keep your presentation because I would like to come back to one point on this. I'll answer your question. Uh, there's no, point, no problem. But uh, I s your, your presentation was very well done. I, th I see the, the book you, you read. Uh, I Marcus sent me the same one. There was some very nice uh, fact mm -hmm. in it. Uh, the only problem that I have, what was the name of the San San Qua San, San, San I don't remember. You remember? No. I don't know. Well, the, the guy was at the BOG, and he was a uh, oak. He, he was like he, he, he was a oak. He, he, this guy was not very happy with all the unconventional policy from the Bank of Japan. <coughs> which is why he left, and it's not it's not a bad thing. But his book was very interesting for all the all the the, the resume he had on the different step of the of the. But just one example, because <coughs> this chart you see on the on the <coughs> on the screen. Uh, 
we can see in the financial press a lot of charts all day long. There's so many blogs and stuff, etc. And <coughs> the problem is that, uh, more generally, maybe we'll come back on it, huh? even when you talk about monetary policy or whatever, there is always in the minds of the people who talk to you or who write something to you some uh, uh, bias, okay? Bias. bias. Thank you. Some bias. Uh, some political bias or some ethical bias, moral bias. It's all a mix, and uh, which makes them present facts to you the way. Uh, a way which is going to help their point of view. For example, this chart. You are just comparing two totally different things, which is the level of the Nikkei index, which is a blue line, I guess, there, and which is the, the amount of yen which the uh, Bank of Japan, uh, Bank of Japan bought uh, with the ETF, equities ETF. First thing, whenever you see a chart with levels, for example, price level, which is not logarithmic, just throw it away. <laughs> First thing, if you look at an index level for a stock market and the, sto the, the, the scale is not logarithmic, it's useless. How can you compare a move from 25,000 to 30,000 to a move from 5,000 to 10,000? You see? So that's the first thing which this chart is first disqualified because of that. Second thing, you can choose this uh, time scale or this scale the way you want, just so that you have the impression, when you look at that, that you are reaching <coughs> the unsustainable, unsustainable, thank you, it's later, unsustainable levels, and that looks like a very risky chart now. But because it just took this way. Anyway, you see the curves don't look the same at all. So this is really u useless, you see. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Th that they have 2 trillion or 18 trillion, or if you had put the chart there, and you choose here to put from 0 to 100, then you would have your chart like that. And that would look very nice, you see? So it's just a question of where you present the stuff. And all the, the, the speech that uh, the, this uh, writer, uh, ex-Bank of Japan uh, official, uh, was writing about the unsustainable activity of the Bank of Japan, uh, is just a word which has no uh, fundamental uh, um, basis in this stuff. He says uh, they are buying, we have to not, and, and all the time, all the words he uses, all the charts he shows, goes to one goal, which is we have to normalize the policy, which means we have to scale back on easing monetary policy. We have to go to a more restrictive monetary policy. Or on the other hand, he also uh, accepts that the Bank of Japan does not fulfill its mandate to go to 2% inflation. So what is he going to say? He says, w I want a more restrictive policy, but I agree we are not at 2% inflation. So what are we going to do? But why don't we change uh, the goal from 2% uh, to 1 to 3? You know, it's what you just uh, talked about. But you know that if you change the goal from 2% to 1 to 3, when the inflation is running at 0.5, as soon as you'll be at 1%, he will say, yeah, well done. So that's really, you know, I just, <laughs> I insist on that, huh, because I, uh, every time it's, it makes me crazy to see that. The, the, the way people, uh, in this case, this, this, this oak from the BOG are presenting stuff is not really fair. So let's go back to, yes. Uh, uh, just to add something, like, uh, I delete from the challenges in the book, he said at the end that one of the main challenges is the debt of Japan. Mm -hmm. And I was unreal uncomfortable, so if you also could come back on the fact that um, the idea that it might not be sustainable for the debt of Japan to keep this purchasing and... Uh, <laughs> because he was really stating that, and I didn't put it because I didn't know what to think about that. So yeah, but the problem is, what does he mean by that? Voilà. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Why does he say it's unsus unsustainable to buy so many bonds in Japan? 
I would, I would, I would add that uh, the, as you, you point out, the, the, the discrepancy between the quantitative, quantitative objective and the price objective, that uh, their quantita quantitative objective is uh, still in the statement around 80 trillion yen. Uh, for the last, I would say, six months, they went down at an uh, annual rhythm of 50 trillion yen. So they don't respect it anymore, which makes it more sustainable. If they had any issue with the quantity in any way, I would go further than, say, than that and say, what is their issue with the quantity? Why does not the Bosch owns 100% of the market? And what, what would be the problem? The problem is that it's not the free market. So that's an ideological uh, uh, starting point from this guy and from other. If you had with people like Fisher at the Federal Reserve or Lacker or Unig, they had exactly the same, uh, the same um, kind of, uh, of uh, reasoning. Um, a few points. Um, you spoke about the, 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 the Bank of Japan in, is insisting about the, the wage bargaining sessions, that they want wages to go higher. Uh, you put the nominal wage uh, chart on that. Uh, one very good example is that uh, they did that themselves, meaning the, 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 the board of governors of the Bank of Japan, the people who do the monetary policy, uh, add themselves a pay rise to give the example to the population and say the pay must go up. I guess it was plus 0.2 percent or something like that, which is a very good example. When you ask the private enterprise, private companies to give pay hikes of 3 percent a year and yourself, you give 0.2. So that's completely inconsistent. Um, I wanted to go back one minute uh, uh, about the quantity versus price discrepancy. Uh, the, as I said, the, the I, I didn't insist enough on it. The, the main objective, uh, when they kept the quantity objective in the statement, is a question of signaling. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, everybody remembers when what happened in 1913, in 2013, uh, when uh, Mr. Bernanke, at the time at the head of the Federal Reserve, spoke about uh, uh, tapering at one time in the future, uh, the amount of bonds they were buying through the quantitative easing program uh, that made the crisis in 2013 on the bond market, which was quite violent uh, at the time, which we called the taper tantrum. And uh, the BOG didn't want to have the same thing happen. Because as soon as you, you, you speak about tapering a program, buying less bonds, as soon as you do that, people are going to think exactly about the steps that you talked about at the end. First tapering, then going to quantitative easing at zero, then ending reinvestment, and then uh, hiking the rates. So tapering, hiking the rates. As people are always thinking forward on investing forward for what is going to happen in two and three years, as soon as you give a signal of tapering, you give a signal of, I'm going to hike the rates. Not in the two months, not in one year, maybe in two years. But you give a signal that the process is going on. And that's exactly what the Bank of Japan didn't want to happen. That's why they couldn't be completely transparent and truthful about uh, their real objective. Um, OK. Now, uh, your question, I'll go back to your question. Uh, the question you ask, uh, the first one, or the, the, the graph I spoke about, uh, FT, you spoke about the Financial Time, an article mm -hmm. about the ECB, why shouldn't they do, ah no, the first question about the, the transmission mechanism, okay, of the quantitative easing uh, on the real lendings, or uh, on the lending of banks to the real economy. Okay, uh, that's, that's uh, the point uh, I, I, I talked about before, is that, uh, putting excess reserves in the system through quantitative easing does not help bank to lend to the real economy. Banks don't need deposits or excess reserves to, to lend to the real economy. Okay? When they lend to a company, they create their own deposit. Bank will only lend to the real economy and uh, 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 
make their loans grow, their, as their balance sheet grow by lending to the real economy. If they find uh, uh, credit worthy customers, and if they have a demand of loans from the customers. So there is no mechanism, there is no transmission between quantitative easing and uh, lending. Uh, regarding the quantity side uh, of liquidity, the, the, the impact of quantitative easing on the rates will have an <coughs> impact through, for example, in the, that's why it, it went uh, way better in the USA than in Japan or in, in, the, in, in Europe, is that a lot of the uh <coughs> American economy uh, is, um, um, uh, stays on the, on the purchasing power uh, on the residential sector, meaning through the mortgage-based security, from the mortgage that the, the American households are going to, uh, to to go to uh, take from their banks. And these mortgage rates are usually uh, viable rates, floating rates mortgage. That means that as soon as you lower all the yield curve, that's what the Fed did with the quantitative easing, uh, the mortgage rates are going to go down as much. And uh, it will be uh, really uh, way more affordable for households to uh, borrow money from banks and to buy houses. And the housing sector is a very powerful sector in the American economy. And uh, it was completely devastated in 2008 and 2009. And having the rates go from, I don't remember, something like 5 6% down to 3% made a real boost to the economy. Because people went back and could refinance their mortgage to the banks. So their, uh, ch the check they were going to send to the bank at the end of the month were much lower, lower and they could even borrow some new money to buy a new house and then help the, the housing sector to bounce back. Okay? Th that's a way of transmission. But, but once again, it's not the quantity of money, it's the price of the yield. Okay? That's correct for it's, it's okay for NASA. <laughs> okay. Uh, second question. Uh, ah. The ECB and the yield curve control. But that's our problem. That's the problem of the Eurozone. Uh, it's very easy to do a yield curve control. They did that in the States, uh, I, I guess, until 2000, to 1952 or 53, when there was a Treasury <coughs> Accord, if I remember well. Uh, they fixed the rates on bonds during the Second World War, etc. There were some new priorities than the free market at the time. It was a world war. So, you know, you, you want free market is one thing, and winning the war is another thing. So uh, they, they fixed the, the rates on bonds at this time, I think, until 1952 or 53. You, you can check, but once again, it's not the exact dates or the exact facts which are important. It's the mechanism. Uh, <coughs> so they could do that in the States. They can do that in Japan now because they have uh, sovereign currency, I would say it's sufficient self-sovereign currency because the country has its own currency. They have only uh, one fiscal counterpart, which is their government, the Treasury Department of the government. Uh, and uh, the country is not indebted in foreign currency, which would be a problem of sovereignty, of monetary sovereignty then. But uh, when you have your own central bank, independent or not, and your own uh, treasury department, you can do whatever you want with your rates, whatever. The, there will be other issues after inflation, uh, currency depreciation anyway, but mechanically speaking, you can do what you want. In Eurozone, we cannot. We cannot do that because uh, we don't have one uh, fiscal counterpart to the central bank. We have uh, a lot of them and uh, they don't agree all of them between themselves. So it's, a, it's an operational nightmare. I guess uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Draghi went as far as he could uh, regarding the institutional constraint that he had. Uh, when, uh, when the crisis erupted on European debt in 2010, uh, I created a synthetic indicator at this time of, uh, uh, let's say, a synthetic 10-year and a synthetic 2-year European bonds. Uh, using the, the um, uh, capital repetition key of the ECB, country by country, to see how, how this average synthetic European bond was responding uh, to the signals and the policy decision of the European Central Bank. Alors, 
the result was quite good. The only problem is that, and it's, it's always the same problem with the average, it's the dispersion, meaning that this synthetic bond was right, reacting quite smoothly to the, to the decision of the central bank, but uh, for example, uh, central bank lowered its rate uh, half, uh, half a point and uh, the bond went uh, down half a point in yield, but you had the German bond going down one point and a half and the Italian bond going up one point. Which means that the, the countries in Europe who needed at this time the, the easiest monetary policy uh, possible were denied of it meaning the peripheral country like Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, Italy, uh, really need very low policy rates because uh, they were in risk of deflation at the time, didn't have their, their yield going down as much as Germany, who did not need them at all and don't need them at all now, uh, was going. So there is an institutional uh, failure in the European project. Uh, I am uh, very uh, open about it because I've always been in favor of the uh, European integration and I was myself uh, in favor of the Maastricht Treaty at the time. I was younger and, uh, and I didn't know uh, all the stuff I studied since. I didn't read uh, some very good books who were uh, written in uh, 92, I think it was Good, good Heart. Good heart? Yeah, we wrote a very nice book at the time explaining how uh, the Eurozone construction was doomed to failure because of these uh, uh, institutional failures. We're still there today, we still have these failures. We're trying to uh, amend them uh, step by step by step. Uh, I would say, uh, to deviate a little from the subject, huh, I would say that one of the, the best uh, news for the uh, European construction is what happened in France uh, the last few months with uh, this uh, quasi revolution of the yellow jacket. Uh, because, because of that, uh, the, the French government is going, whether you, you like it or not, huh, but is going to deviate from the Maastricht uh, criteria. And, uh, and uh, the, the Germans are not going to say anything about it because they are really afraid that the situation goes worse and worse in France. And if so Italy is first a big problem, if France goes in the mix with another bigger problem, Europe is going to implode. And if the Eurozone implodes, uh, contrary to what happened with Greece, one of my main uh, hypotheses uh, since 2010 is that if the Eurozone implodes, it's because Germany will go out of it first. So we have questions for the... Yes. Uh, I didn't answer the third question. There was a third question, no? Uh, why does it take so long for the budge to achieve the top percentage yet? But I would say first because quantity was not the solution. Price is the solution. They are trying to do it. Let's see what happens. But uh, why don't they print money <laughs> and see what happens? What's the risk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who wants to? Oh no, we might answer the question. No, but oh, we can collect the names. No, no, but uh, yeah, so what? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm Matthias Torczynski from Option B2, which is macroeconomics, political economy, and finance. I have two quite technical questions, actually, but I think you might help me clarify them. The first one. Um, You've been talking about yield curve, and I would like to know, part, I mean, specifically, not only about Japan, but generally, if central banks do target the curve or specific, I mean, a specific yield or of a specific bond, um, and I mean, or if they generally care about the curve itself, the difference between the yields of different bonds, uh, of different duration bonds, I mean, do they? always care about that, sometimes uh, what happens if the curve is reversed, um, and if, it, if you think that matters. And the second, well, I come from Argentina where we have a kind of long time experience with debt and with those problems, uh, and generally what we do there is caring about the net debt, which is the debt net of, I mean, of debt with other public sector institutions. Uh, so I would like to know if you have in mind how much, I mean, we, we were, you were saying 250% of GDP of debt, but how much of that is 
intra-public sector debt and if markets actually care about that or not, generally. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Alors, uh, you asked me the in the in, in case of the yield curve control, uh, which part of the curve the central bank is watching is is trying to control mainly? I mean, well, they care about the difference. They care the about yields. the they care about the curve, the the, yeah, the, the shape of the yes, curve. Absolutely. Uh, the the only case we can talk openly today is the Japan because it's, it's only in Japan that we have the yield curve control. Mm -hmm. Even I say that in the QE American QE program it was about yield more than quantity, yeah. but we don't have the the transparency that uh, we can use in case of Japan. Uh, in case of Japan. What you saw in the chart is that when they put the, the, the ZIRP into the NIRP uh, territory, <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't know how that sounds, but uh, when they put their, their deposit rate from zero to negative, we saw all the curve collapse, okay, and which um, to a point uh, when we had, uh, I think the bonds were up to n the 15 years maturity at zero or less, and the 30 year bonds went down to 0.25. Alors, when that happened, and that's why they, they switched to the yield curve control more explicitly, because they didn't want the curve to be so flat. Okay. Why? Because once again, it's uh, uh, it's a bias, more uh, bias, sorry, more <laughs> a bias, more than uh, more than a, a logical uh, will, because that will help their, uh, to uh, obtain their objective of two percent inflation. It's just that uh, their, the 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 main uh, uh, interlocutors of a central bank are the financial markets, are the banks, are the big pension funds, and. Uh, the, the people who have been the most affected by a very flat little curve are the banks and the pension funds. Because if they, if they have to invest in long-term maturity bonds, especially the pension funds, who are, uh, their objective is to own bonds for 100, 200 years. They are going to roll over, roll over all the money they have to give to all the pensioners, which is a, a, a quite a subject in Japan. Um, so when the curve goes so flat at 0.25 on the 30 years bonds, uh, they go to the Bank of Japan and say, what are you doing to us? You put our, our, our economical model in danger, we're going to go bankrupt, or we are not going to be uh, able to pay, uh, to pay uh, our pensioners uh, some good uh, rents that we used to do before, etc., etc." The banks themselves go to the Bank of Japan and say, our job is to do maturity transformation. I mean, to collect the money from the people who put them in deposit in our, in, in our safes and to lend it to uh, the government and to, 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 to earn the carry of this ill curve. Well, you could have been the Bank of Japan and say, okay, so what? That's your business model. That's your problem. My objective is to have inflation go back to 2%. I'm not in the business of making commercial <coughs> bank uh, earning free money on the safe asset ill curve of the government. And I'm not in the model of the sustainability of your pension uh, calculation. After, like in every uh, situation like that, monetary policy and academics is a thing. Politics is another one. So there are some pressure, some lobby groups, etc. And so they decided that it was uh, safer to have a, a, a ill curve a little more uh, steeper. And by uh, putting the emphasis on the 10-year bonds and not intervening anymore in the longer term bonds, they just did that, meaning that today, uh, I don't know if the 30 years is around 60 or 70 BP, so it's not a bonanza for the pensioners or the banks, huh? because 0 and 70, uh, it's not a very big carry, but that's better. Okay. That looks like, and when they did the last change on going from minus 10 plus 10 to minus 20 plus 20, that was not to have the 10 years yield move a lot, because mm -hmm. at the first time, everybody thought, oh, again, a signaling of uh, uh, stricter monetary policy. So they tried to push the yield up, 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 
and I think it started at 0 0.17, 0 0.16, and then it went down naturally, and even at minus 5 BP uh, two days ago. So the 10 years didn't move a lot, but the 30 and 20 years moved up. They went down a little later, but they, they moved up, and that's easier, and I think that was the goal. If that doesn't answer your question? Yeah. Okay, and second question was the net debt. Net debt, a very, very interesting concept. I would say uh, much more interesting than the gross debt, obviously. Uh, when you see Japan with 250% uh, of debt to GDP, but the Bank of Japan owns 84% uh, of the marketable debt, uh, that doesn't make so much. Uh, you've got to take into account also the social security funds. Uh, so. At the end, uh, at the end, uh, if you uh, are logical and consider uh, all the public institutions and as one uh, coherent body, of course, uh, Japan debt is not so huge as uh, it appears. Uh, the only fact is that, as I said, they are not printing money today. They are just changing asset, and the market anticipate that one day or another, it will be another than one day, I guess. Uh, the the uh, these bonds will come back to the market and the central bank will reduce its balance sheet and so you will have a net debt again uh, important some also compare uh, like to compare the the debt uh, uh, taking into account in fact in front of that the assets that the government owns mm -hmm. uh, which is a big issue because let's say for example a country like France the government has a lot of assets. I would not say they are going to sell the Eiffel Tower to uh, pay the debt, but they have a lot of assets. They have a participation in, a, in, a, in stocks, in companies on the market, etc., etc. And when uh, we, s we talk about the debt to GDP in France, which is around uh, 90 or 100 percent now, it doesn't take it into account the assets which are in front of that, which is not logical also. So there's a lot of conceptual uh, things still to work on, but. Uh, but just be aware that uh, when people are going to show you figures like that, mm -hmm. why do they use these figures? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, you mentioned, I uh, think, in your presentation about how there was, um, as a result of QE, uh, there was changes in portfolio compositions in the private sector. I'm not sure if you were referring like to all the countries or just Japan or the US. Uh, and I'd like to ask, um, what what was the key uh, transmi transmission mechanism of QE uh, in the US? Was it this kind of uh, portfolio rebalancing, uh, or was it also perhaps like uh, signaling and like the expectations channel? Um, because you also mentioned how the liquidity channel basically that didn't work because basically we have endogenous money, so banks don't need the liquidity in order to lend. So yeah, what was the main? Uh, transmission. You just uh, answer. Should we <laughs> yeah. pass it to the next question? Or oh, the next one? Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh no, I prefer to answer one by one if you don't mind, because uh, otherwise I forgot after. <laughs> uh, but I'll do it quickly, but because you answered everything in your question, by, by the way. Uh, the, the, no, the, the transmission mechanism, me mechanism sorry, of the quantitative easing in the USA was the portfolio rebalancing. The signaling effect, because as soon as you begin to buy bonds, that means that you're not going to high rates for a very long time. They reinforce that with uh, the forward guidance. And uh, the third uh, transmission mechanism was uh, going down, of was the lower yields, which helped, as I talk about, specifically for the housing sectors, but also the automobile sectors, etc. But it has never been a question of quantity. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Luise. I'm also from track B2. And my question is more, <laughs> okay, maybe a bit off topic, but not really because we are you, both you and my colleagues mentioned it. Um, so it's so more the, the real side of uh, where inflation comes from, namely, as I'm trained as a post Keynesian econom economist, I see inf inflation mainly as the outcome of uh, a conflict over um, income claims. So we addressed the issue that there were no real ways, real wage rises in Japan. And you mentioned the strategy of mm, the Bank of Japan that they gave themselves uh, a pay rise. Um, so I, I wondered if, if you, you'd know some, if you 
if you can elaborate a bit on the institutional circumstances in Japan, which maybe don't allow these pay rises, or um, if if uh, or how this how how powerful it actually is if the Bank of Japan gives themselves a pay rise in, as a role model, so to say. Okay, um, w one uh, one of the obvious answers uh, is uh, one that your colleague uh, pointed out uh, on in, in their presentation. It's a demographic effect, okay? Uh, because the demographic effect uh, has some uh, huge political consequences uh, uh, on the economy. I, I explain why. Uh, as soon as uh, people get older and older, which is the case in mostly all the uh, advanced economies today, uh, we are confronted with a system where uh, uh, when the, the uh, retirement uh, laws process or social security retirement uh, uh, funds were put into place, let's say for example, I, I use France because I, I know the example in France, uh, when we created the, the first age of retirement of uh, on France at 65 uh, was just after the Second World War, I guess, in France. Uh, at this time, uh, the life esperancy was lower than that. Okay? Uh, the system is, is uh, created as uh, the people who work uh, uh, put some money that goes to pay for the people who don't work anymore who are retired. Uh, as long as the proportion uh, of people working and the proportion of people not working retired uh, is stable, this system can work. As soon as the people live much longer than that, because now we, I would say, France 80 years old, roughly, the life expectancy, uh, the system cannot work mathematically. The only solution would be, uh, if you want to pay the same thing, uh, of course, <coughs> to, the, to, to the retiree, to, to have them go uh, into uh, retirement later, okay? Not 65, maybe 67, 69. You could, you could even put a, a, a law in place which links uh, the life expectancy to the age of retirement. If the, it goes down, it goes down. If it goes up, it goes up. If you want to respect a, a stable uh, mechanical funding model. The other solution is, as s a lot of countries do that, they say, okay, you, stand, you can still go on retirement at 65, but you are not going to earn 100% of your retirement, but 80%, if you want 100%, you'll have to work until 67. Well, the problem is that, uh, regarding inflation, uh, I come back to your topic, uh, the people who suffer the most from inflation are going to be the retirees, okay? Uh, on top of that, their uh, retirement is not indexed to inflation anymore, okay? Which is one, which was one of the big uh, 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 revendication of the gilets jaunes in France the last few weeks to put that back in place. So if you've got, like you have in France, two percent inflation and uh, zero point five uh, uh, hike of uh, retirement. Uh, uh, contribution, uh, no, not contribution, disbursement, uh, this population is losing money every year, okay? But for the mechanical uh, uh, funding system to still work, you have to have these people losing money all year, especially when you are in a country when uh, the, the, the 18 to 35 years old population has got a, a non-employment ratio of higher than 20%, and in the suburb, higher than 50%. So you've got to have priorities. The problem is that today, as we are in democracy, all the big decision relev decisions relevant to the priorities that the government has to put in, the, in its economy, uh, all these big decisions uh, are decided by elections. Or the people, the older they are, the more they vote. They don't have anything else to do on the Sunday anyway. No, but that's true. I'm, go I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm closer to this population than yours, so I can speak <laughs> frankly about that, is that uh, when you're 70 years old and uh, the Sunday, oh, there's a good thing to do, we're going to go to vote. You're 20, 20 years old, a Sunday, uh, you went out very late uh, the Saturday evening, uh, you've got friends coming by, you don't vote so much. Okay, 
the problem is that the, the, the impact uh, of the older popi population on the formation of the governments in the modern democracy and on these decisions which are going to be taken afterwards for the economy are disproportionately uh, centered on the needs of the older population because these people are more motivated to go on board. There are some solutions, uh, even the Gilets jaunes ask for, uh, because they have also contra contradictory uh, 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 revendication, but there was a mandat mandatory vote. Let's say, I spoke with my children the other yesterday about that, say uh, they are 17 and 15 years old, and I say that could be a good solution. Say, so, oh no, uh, I don't want to vote uh, if he's 19 or sleep. Uh, okay, but uh, I say, uh, well, if we go, uh, we go and we vo we vote uh, white. You know, if I, uh, I say maybe, but maybe if you go to the boxing ballot, uh, you will think about what you want to vote. So. If you have some uh, some uh, entertainments with the French system, maybe you have some obligation to go and vote. Voilà. And there is another, uh, so that's completely off topic, but uh, one uh, proposition I've been pushing forward the last few years is to, uh, as we do for the fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal bulletin at the end of the year is to modulate uh, the vote of the people by the number of kids they have uh, on their uh, charge, you see what I mean? Because I say a guy who is 30 years old and has got two kids or three and five years old will have three votes, as long as he's taking care of his kids. <laughs> well, that's, well, but so as long as we are in this modern democracy with the voting structure as it is, uh, we will have low inflation because the people who decide want low inflation, the older one. They don't want inflation. That's a nightmare for them. So they are going to oppose anything that could uh, help inflation to go back to up to 2 or 3 percent. Even the Bank of Japan said that they were going to overshoot. Let them see, let, let them do that, but uh, I'm skeptical that they will be able with the tool that they have at their disposal now. They should print money, they are the perfect country to try that. They're trying something new and bold, but the other step is to directly print money and, and inject money into the economy. Nobody cares about their balance sheet soundness, their central bank, they can print all the liability they want. Let's go that step. Um, hi, thanks. My name is Sophie. My name is Sophie. I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics and Finance, and I'm interested on the impact of um, this long period of quantitative and qualitative easing on the financial sector and on particularly on the banking sector, how it has affected its stability, its business model. So if you have any insight into that. Oh, that, that, uh, I, th I think I answered that before with the, the, <coughs> the, steep, the, the, the shape of the yield curve. Uh, I, mean, I mean, this unconventional policy put rates very low and the uh, yield curve quite flat, huh, even if it's a little steeper now. And that's not helpful for the banking system. You were speaking about the banking system? I yeah, that? but I was wondering whether it's had let banks, for example, take excessive risks, so if it has put the system itself at more risk so that they're experiencing um, greater vulnerabilities or greater risks in the financial system or in the banking system. So the implications of that, basically. Ah, okay. You, f financial system stability, uh, if that's what you're referring to. Okay, Wh which, was, which is usually also quite a, a, a usually an, ar an argument from the, the, from the guy who would be booked, uh, the, the hooks. They are always saying, whoa, financial system instability, that's very dangerous, quantitative easing, people are going to take too much risk, and the system will eventually crash. Uh, when you speak about financial system instability, there's a few things. There's the market, the asset markets, the stock market, mostly it's what people look at, huh? and the banking system stability, which can uh, play once again as we saw in 2008. Uh, the banking system stability is not the responsibility of the monetary policy. The banking system stability is a problem of prudential controls and capital buffers, okay? 
which may or may not be the responsibility of, of the central bank. In Europe, we have the central bank having the, the uh, division taking care of that. But it should be completely independent from monetary policy. And even the government can intervene and ask banks to have more capital buffer. And it's, it's really a fiscal, uh, a fiscal decision. Uh, the monetary policy aims to uh, uh, achieve its goal of 2% inflation. Okay, so uh, now regarding the asset markets. Alors, if you talk about the stock market, the equity markets, uh, I don't have a clue. No, but that's true. I say I don't have a clue. I, that's my job day to day to speak about my with my customer to tell you you should buy or you should sell the stock market. But uh, who, who knows that uh, the, the, the Nikkei index uh, today is worth I think it's quite cheap. It's worth 16,000, something like that. I don't remember. Uh, with yields that are going to stay very low for a very long time in Japan. With a, a, a yield on equity with the dividend size, are, I'll say 2.5% or something like that. And with bonds yielding nothing, the portfolio rebalancing channel should help equities market. And, and equities, mm, if they crash tomorrow, it would maybe because there's a Japan, there's a China-American trade war. The Central Bank of Japan doesn't have, doesn't have anything to do with that. I, if the Nikkei was worth 40,000 because everybody was buying equity, equity, equities because bonds don't yield anything, we could have this discussion and saying there is a financial stability risk, equities market are way too high. They are not way too high, nowhere in the world. Even the US market went down a little uh, this last month. And in Europe, they are not way too high. We are way lower than the high we made in 2007. And in Nikkei, we are not way too high. Either. So I don't think there's any special stability risk, financial stability risk on asset markets coming from the central bank policy. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Well, we so thank you. You're welcome. That's a nice time. Thank you.